Welcome to our second virtual DLS uh, for the fall semester, uh, everybody. Uh, really excited to continue our series. We've got a lot of really great people who, I guess, you know, virtual makes it a little easier to, to get here, which is great, but we've got a really super slate of speakers for this fall. And uh, certainly I'm excited to have Mark Torres with us uh, today. Um, I guess we were just trying to, I was just trying to remember, but uh, I guess probably I met Mark first when he was kind of looking around at grad schools, which would have been around 2009, 2010 period. Um, yeah. He got his bachelor's at uh, Pitzer, I think. Um, so uh, Southern California, and he ended up staying in Southern California for uh, PhD work at USC, where he worked with um, Josh West there. And then I guess he stuck around even longer and did a, a postdoc then at Caltech. So kind of bounced around in that region. Um, but uh, through that whole period and up to now, um, he's a assistant professor at Rice University. Um, I guess I've been particularly impressed by the creative biogeochemical cycles work that Mark does. He's um, working on large scale biogeochemical cycling, controls on elemental cycling in our systems, across our systems in the present and in the past, and uh, applying a creative approach to that, particularly linking biogeochemical cycles in creative ways. He's done some interesting work on coupling between the carbon and sulfur cycles. And a lot of uh, his work these days is focusing on, um, on uh, weathering as a control on various different biogeochemical cycles uh, using a combination of observational and modeling approaches. Um, he is a Sloan Foundation fellow, um, it's funny from the Sloan Foundation. Uh, uh, I was excited to see an ACS PRF grant come through from him, uh, which everybody on the panel was excited about a couple of years ago. He's worked for them. And um, in just the last few years, I think he's really kind of started to build a, a vibrant program uh, in biogeochemical cycling at Rice, uh, which is someplace where he's got great colleagues to work on that kind of stuff with. So I'm excited he could take some time to talk with us today about his work and I'll turn it over to Mark. Cool, so um, thank you very much for this invitation to come sort of share some of my work. And I guess I'll start with kind of maybe the uh, biggest picture view and you know, in a couple of words, the motivation behind my work is this idea of um, planetary habitability. And to kind of put that phrase into a picture, I really like this one. So this is from uh, NASA, the sort of MODIS uh, um, satellite. And it's a picture of the Gulf of Aden uh, off the coast of Africa. And uh, it amazes me that it's not just that our planet is habitable, but it, it is so teeming with life. We can even see microscopic organisms from space. And um, it's not just that our planet's habitable now. Uh, we also sort of think that it was habitable early in its history and that habitability was maintained over you know, billions of years. And that begs the question, uh, was that um, sort of a happy accident or are there uh, processes, mechanisms, et cetera, that we could uh, point to and understand that underlie the habitability of our planet and what might those mean about our sort of search for, for habitable worlds elsewhere in the universe? Now there are many components to habitability, right? You need an energy source, you need nutrients. Um, but if we sort of take an earth-centric perspective, uh, liquid water or, or sort of an equitable climate that uh, maintains liquid water is a component that we think is important. And on earth, again, uh, climate is intimately coupled to the carbon cycle. And that's because of the greenhouse properties of CO2 gas. So one way we can think about understanding habitability is by understanding the way that the carbon cycle behaves. And that's really what I'm gonna talk about today. So again, a very broad overview of the carbon cycle. Uh, what we're worried about in a way is the uh, concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere because that's what affects climate. And over really long time scales, that depends on the sort of balance between inputs and outputs. So we get CO2 to surficial reservoirs from uh, the solid earth, right? That's volcanic, metamorphic to gassing and sedimentary recycling. And then those are, uh, those, you know, carbon's also removed from the earth's surface through the formation and burial of particulate or organic matter, 
uh, which is sort of this image on the left, you know, some, some bits of uh, fossil leaves, and also uh, inorganic carbon, and, and typically that's in the form of, of calcium carbonate. Now, you know, there's a little bit of a transformation that has to happen there, right? If we uh, receive CO2 as, as a gas, but it leaves as a solid phase, uh, there needs to be some chemical conversion. And so uh, it turns out that water-rock interactions, which are sort of collectively called weathering, are, are key to this transformation. And we can think about this with some kind of uh, schematic reactions. We can think about, uh, in bold here, some sort of uh, calcium silicate mineral that might be present on land, you know, on a mountain range. And it will react with water and CO2 gas to produce uh, dissolved uh, ions, like this calcium ion and this bicarbonate ion. And those ultimately get transported to the ocean by rivers, where marine calcifiers can combine those ions into this solid phase calcium carbonate that will um, you know, sort of result in the removal of CO2 from surficial systems. And now it's not so much that, uh, or, you know, this is a key necessary step, but beyond it being just one of the necessary components, we also think that it might act as a sort of regulatory feedback. And you can imagine, right, if we added more CO2 from degassing all of a sudden, the climate would warm, so it would get hotter and potentially wetter. And under those conditions, the sort of rate at which those minerals, like this calcium silicate, break down uh, might be enhanced. That sort of makes intuitive sense. Uh, and then, right, since that's driving more carbon uh, uh, burial, um, the system can stabilize, stabilize itself. So we can imagine that the sea cycle will be stable if weathering and, and any associated carbonate burial are some positive functions of atmospheric CO2. And this kind of line of thinking, you know, I did not invent it. It's been around uh, since actually the 1800s through uh, this French scientist Jacques Ebelman. And it's kind of been a motivating uh, sort of idea behind the research that I do and um, others. And now there are many ways, right, one can uh, approach this set of questions, like how does this work? Um, you can sort of do experiments where you put minerals, you know, in a jar. Uh, we can think about measuring soil profiles where the silicate minerals might be present. But the approach I take is to use rivers. Um, and the sort of motivation, right, to why, why I look at rivers specifically is because the land surface is heterogeneous, right? If I take a soil sample uh, in one particular location, is that valid uh, for, you know, a, a few miles or, or you know, kilometers away. And, and it's hard to say if, if that is true or not. Um, now, so rivers essentially spatially integrate over their entire catchment area. So all of the water that falls over um, you know, this sort of defined area flows to the surface, subsurface, chemically reacts with minerals, it gets collected in this river, and so we are averaging over that heterogeneity. And rivers are the thing that transport dissolved ions to the ocean. So by measuring at the river, we're sort of intercepting it on its way to the ocean. And, and we can actually measure the rate or the total mass transferred per unit time. And that's ultimately the number we might care about, like how much calcium you know, per year is being moved to the ocean to drive uh, you know, the formation of, of calcium carbonate. Uh, rivers aren't without their complications though. So rivers are very dynamic. And so I like this picture, um, this is from uh, a river I study in Peru, um, just taken at two times of the year. One of them, so the top picture, during low flow, it's very uh, sort of calm river, a and then during flood stage, right, in the bottom, the river is, um, uh, looks very different. And so we kind of need to be able to understand and, and uh, capture this, um, these sort of dynamics if we really want to be able to use rivers um, to address problems that operate on Kind of longer time scales, right? If I can sample, my sample is only representative of an hour that the river was behaving that way, uh, I probably can't extrapolate to uh, sort of thousands, hundreds of years. Um, and so I need to kind of be able to, to sort of think about that problem. And then, you know, sort of the double edged sword of spatial integration is that uh, rivers are complex mixtures, right? If I want to only understand, you know, what the river is moving in terms of silicate cations. Um, I somehow have to account for all of the other processes uh, that might add ions or, or change their abundances, their ratios in rivers. And I, I kind of need to account for that. And at the same time, I also want to know, right, um, if I'm at rivers draining both mountains and a floodplain, like, which portion of the landscape is contributing more or less if I want to kind of think about mechanism. 
And so these sorts of big questions are what I'm going to talk about today. Um, and I'm going to start with maybe what's conceptually simple is what sets the concentration of weathering products in river water um, and its temporal variability. And so with that, we can look at some data. So uh, this is a plot of, um, on the y, uh, sorry, on the x-axis is the, uh, what we call river discharge. So it's the, the volume of water moved per unit time normalized by the catchment area. So we get a length per time. And on the y-axis is the uh, calcium concentration dissolved in that river water whenever I took that uh, sort of sample at a specific flow rate. And, you know, there's scatter in this relationship, right? There's, you know, all the data points don't plot on top of each other. Um, but there is a coherent relationship. And, and this data is from Elder Creek, which is in California. And the reason I like to show this data specifically is because it was collected over nearly 30 years, so 1968 to 1996. So there's some uh, sort of stationarity in, in these sorts of uh, relationships between concentration and discharge, or CQ for short. Um, now, you know, to some, you know, to first order, right, what we really care about is the flux, right? How much, what mass of calcium is being used, uh, moved to the ocean period of time. And it turns out to get that mass flux, it's just the product of the x and y axes, right? The, the volumetric flow rate times the concentration is going to be this mass flow rate. So we really need to characterize this covariation um, if we just want to get the number right. Um, but beyond just you know, needing it to, to, to sort of accurately estimate fluxes, um, it in and of itself has some interesting uh, features. So this red line that I plotted here is just a power law that's saying, uh, calcium concentrations are proportional, uh, proportional to the discharge raised to some exponent b. And that exponent b is kind of uh, sort of an interesting number to pull out of this relationship because it tells us something about how sensitive the system is potentially to uh, climate change. So now I've sort of done what I sort of said, we're taking the product of concentration to discharge, plotting that in the y, and then uh, plotting discharge in the x again. And now these lines correspond to different values for that b exponent. Um, so, uh, you know, we can expect that if we change the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, that uh, there are going to be likely changes in the amount of rainfall and potentially river flow. Um, and so, right, if we know that discharge, let's say, is going to double, we can follow one of these lines and make a prediction for how much the calcium flux is going to change. Um, if we assume, right, that this relationship we've measured, this B value is constant. Um, and if the B value is closer to zero, right, fluxes change uh, proportionally to discharge, where if the B value is lower, like minus one, um, essentially the, the flux is independent of discharge, or the system is not sensitive to that climate forcing. So an important question is, uh, what time scale is that prediction valid? Um, certainly it's valid over the time period I have data, right, because we know that the sort of relationship has been sort of maintained at a constant B value. Um, but can I extend that to, let's say, uh, 10,000 years ago? Does that work? Is that prediction valid? Um, and, you know, this is not theoretical. People are actually doing that, right? There's already papers published applying this, what I call CQ theory, to uh, high cast weathering fluxes and potentially also uh, forecast in the future. But, you know, we can't go back in time to sort of test to see if they were right. And we would have to wait a long time in the future to see if the predictions uh, are, are sort of match what really happens. And so instead of waiting a long time, uh, another alternative is to really understand mechanistically what's going on, right? If we understand the mechanism, then we could uh, sort of address the question, is the projection or the sort of extrapolation valid? So uh, to think about mechanism, let's start with maybe the simplest explanation possible. So we can imagine that rain falling on a catchment flows to the subsurface, and then uh, after it flows in the subsurface, it enters the river channel. And we're going to treat that as a pipe. So water, the rainfall enters one end of the pipe at the soil, and the outlet of the pipe is the river. And we can predict the concentration of the outlet as the, being the product of you know, some reaction rate, so how fast the minerals dissolve, uh, the amount of surface area or reactive surface area of minerals available in the pipe, uh, the sort of volume of that pipe, how much water it stores, and the duration of the reaction. How long does it take water to flow from one end to the other? And it turns out that sort of duration is related to flow rate. If I pump faster through that pipe, then water is gonna spend on average a shorter amount of time in the reactor. So that simple kind of set of equations predicts that concentrations should be proportional to discharge 
raised to the minus one power. And it turns out this model fails spectacularly. So what this is, is a, a, a compilation, um, sort of my colleague Jens Harden put together, called the Global River Chemistry Database. And what I just queried, that database for um, 1,224 know, rivers, and I calculated their uh, concentration discharge relationship. So I fit that power law and took that B. And you can see for two you know, random solutes, sort of sodium and silicon, these are just uh, elements that um, are derived from the breakdown of silicate minerals, that essentially uh, that B minus one prediction is uh, uncommon or, or non-existent. Um, so I'm not the first person to point that out. Um, so this has been mentioned or brought up before. And some other people have come up with uh, sort of potential solutions to that discrepancy. But I sort of bring this up as like, you know, there's a little bit sort of interesting things going on here that we might want to explain. So uh, as with many problems in geology, we can find a solution by making it nonlinear. So uh, it turns out if we add a nonlinear relationship between reaction rate and discharge, this is proposed by Kate Maher, um, then we could go from this simple pipe to the kinds of data where we have sort of B values closer to zero. Um, alternatively, we can put a nonlinear relationship between the sort of uh, surface area and discharge. Uh, and this was sort of proposed by Sarah Godsey, and you can sort of reconcile or think about this as, as you're sort of moving the water table up and down uh, in the land surface, and that's sort of changing the sort of surface area that's being uh, um, uh, exposed to chemical weathering. So uh, now there are many terms, right, we, that I showed here, and, and right, we can also think about other ways of writing this. Um, and the question is, right, what if I put the nonlinear somewhere else, right? I can justifiably make something like the reaction duration a nonlinear function of discharge. Um, and you know, if I did that, would I also get a B value close to zero? A zero? And if I did that, what does it mean about using this theory to extrapolate or, or hindcast weathering fluxes? It turns out for the sort of Maher or, or, or Gazi hypothesis, you might reasonably expect that one can extrapolate forward and backwards um, these sorts of concentration discharge relationships. However, that might not be true of other mechanisms. And this then gets this fundamental issue, right? If I have multiple explanations for the same data, how do I know which one is right? And does it matter, right? Um, one way of maybe trying to address that is, does every mechanism uh, have the sort of a, you know, an equally big effect on the result? So, right, the data aren't all minus one, but they are spread over quite a wide range. And, you know, how much would surface area need to change catchment to catchment to explain that variability? And, and do I think that's reasonable? So we can kind of apply sort of Occam's razor approach to thinking about different mechanisms. So, you know, kind of as I set this up, I'm gonna throw in a third idea for what's going on here. Um, and we sort of gonna to wanna to test it. And as I have implied, the third idea I'm gonna throw out is something to do with this reaction duration. So to come up with a sort of a, a model for reaction duration, I'm going to uh, take this sort of approach of building a more complicated reactor. And so really what this is, is sort of a, a model for a river catchment that's two boxes. And those are meant to represent like a, a shallow aquifer and a deep aquifer. And I, I took this from Jim Kirshner. And the, the equations are there, but they're not important. Um, the reason we're gonna use this model is because it's simple enough that I can run it a lot of times, but it's complex enough that it shows some dynamics that I think are important. And what we can do is we can feed it real rainfall data like I have shown here. And the output of the model is a precipitation, or sorry, a rainfall time series, ah, a river flow time series um, that has properties that look like real river flow data. And so I just want to highlight what those are. So the first one is this distinction between velocity and celerity. So again, we can imagine this pipe analogy. Uh, water is entering in one end and it's aging. So it's sort of modeling as a color change. Um, and it, it's sort of what comes out at the end is old. Now, if I were to rapidly increase the flow rate into the pipe, the pressure wave would push out water at the other end. So I would get a rapid response in the flow rate, but the water coming out would be old. And it turns out that's what rivers actually do, that there's a really rapid discharge response. So you can sort of see all these peaks in the, in the sort of output time series, but the water that's coming out during these peaks, a lot of it is water that had been stored. So another feature that this model produces, is sort of uh, put in quotations, is dispersion. And, and that is to say that we shouldn't really think about the age of water coming out um, 
as a one number, right? We should really think about it as a distribution of ages. Um, and we can sort of think about that as a, a sort of transit time or the time it takes water from being a raindrop entering the sort of catchment to leaving as a river flow. And certainly we're gonna get um, the sort of dispersion or, or a range of ages from uh, you know, different path lengths and, and that path lengths, you know, that's gonna arise kind of like I showed here from you know, poor scale dispersion, but we're also gonna get dispersion at much larger scales, right? Hill slopes are different lengths, different orientations, and the rainfall itself is, is sort of spatially distributed over the catchment. So we should expect this sort of distribution of flow path lengths and, and uh, reaction durations or, or transit times. And, and that's what this model gives us. Um, and it doesn't just give us a, a range of ages, right? It gives us actually a range of ages that changes in time. So it's a, a non-steady state. And so this is kind of just a, um, some output. And we can sort of think about that as the ratio of old to young water changes with flow. So this light green color, this is for high discharge where um, there's mostly water that's very, very young and this heavy tailed old ages. But as the sort of discharge drops, right, we get maybe a more broad distribution that has some sort of mode at intermediate ages. And if I'm able to get these age distributions, right, I can predict solute concentrations, right? If I assume a reaction rate, I know the time, I can predict concentration. So I can go from these age distributions to concentration so that I can arrive at my concentration discharge. And now to kind of do a fair test of, of what I think versus what other people think, uh, I've used the reaction rate model uh, of the Kate Maher paper. So that is to say, I put in their nonlinear reaction rates and I'm gonna add my sort of uh, complicated transit time distribution change with uh, water flow rate, and we can compare them against each other to see which one uh, has a bigger effect or, or sort of changes the, uh, the sort of model result. Um, so with that, um, we can sort of look at some data. And the first thing that this model sort of shows that's kind of interesting is that if I just change the rainfall pattern, I get a different concentration discharge. And so the way to look at this is just pay attention to the different colored lines. So you can see this orange one. This is where I uh, sort of have low rainfall overall, right? This discharge is, is low. And as we increase the amount of rain, we go to this sort of green curve. And it's not so much that discharge just goes up, but the curve accidentally actually shallows. And this is important. That is to say that if I make the climate wetter, the weathering flux I get out is even bigger than I would expect if I just extrapolated what I got um, before the change in climate. And this sort of makes sense, right? Because what's going on is rainfall doesn't just change the amount of water output through the system. It might also change sort of the uh, sort of size of aquifers and their, and their behaviors. And that then has a feedback or effect on chemical weathering by changing sort of the duration in which these reactions occur. And then this other sort of point I want to make is a little bit more subtle. And this is just uh, you know, a bunch of concentration discharge relationships that we get from the model run over essentially you know, keeping most things constant, but just varying um, the sort of uh, thing I added, which is this time variable transit time distribution shape. Um, and we just get a wide range, right? The concentration destroyed. Some of them uh, concentrations decrease a lot, other ones it's more stable. And, and the kind of the point here is that it's pretty much the whole range you see in nature uh, we can explain with um, just different hydrologic behavior. Um, and so we can maybe think that this hydrologic behavior is, is as important as uh, the sort of reaction rate dynamics. Um, this takes us back to the problem, right? If we have multiple mechanisms and they all produce data or you know, results that look like real data, um, which is right. How do we add unique to this, uniqueness to this problem, right? Essentially, I can assume a fundamentally different mechanism and arrive at the same concentration discharge relationship. So this is something that we've been thinking about. And so um, we've been trying to do this with real data. And the first kind of thing we, we thought to add is using water isotope time series as a tracer of water age. So this is some data I have from the previous 80s in Amazon. The sort of uh, blue colored bars are measurements of, of rainfall collected in a catchment. And the length of the bars is the amount of time which I collected that rain. And what you can see is this high amplitude uh, seasonal cycle that looks approximately sinusoidal. We can, in that same catchment, measure the river flow. And these are these gray circles. And you can see that that sine wave is amplitude damped and phase lag. So, right, we can actually use the extent of amplitude damping and phase lag as a way to sort of back out some constraint 
on how old the water is as it's flowing out through the system. And you know, this is a way it constrains sort of transit times and, and, and potentially their distribution. I did not invent this method, it exists before, but has not been uh, explicitly incorporated into this sort of concentration discharge analysis. The other thing that we sort of want to add is sort of more isotopes, and this is kind of you know, the sort of geochemist trick. And the uh, isotope system that we're sort of interested in is silicon isotopes, right? If we're interested in silicate weathering, you know, major component of all silicate minerals is uh, silicon isotopes. And uh, we don't really have to go into the nitty gritty details of, of how silicon isotopes behave, but the point is they fractionate during weathering. And specifically, we think that they trace the reaction uh, progress. So um, if the isotope value is heavier, there has been more reaction. And if the isotope value is lower, there has been less reaction. And so we sort of should kind of think, right, that this um, reaction progress maps on to water age, right? If the water spent less time in the catchment, it should have had less time for reaction, so it should be less reactive. If it spent more time in the catchment, it should be more reactive. So in that way, silicon isotopes tell us something about how uh, reactions evolve in time. And beyond that, um, because the sort of underlying process for isotope fractionation is sort of a nonlinear relationship, so sort of plotted here is one model for fractionation called Rayleigh fractionation, and it predicts that as you sort of react silica, the isotope value evolves along this kind of curve. Um, mixing, in a, oh, mixing in a sort of relationship between isotopes and concentration is hyperbolic. So if I mix water that's old, that has reacted a lot, with uh, water that is young, that has reacted very little, I'm, I'm gonna get pulled off the fundamental relationship between isotope ratios and concentration. And so in that way, if I don't have the transit time distribution shape right, I'm not gonna be able to predict the isotopes right. So I can kind of have a joint fitting of concentration, discharge, water isotopes, and silicon isotopes to kind of see if I can um, extract from the data what mechanism is most important for explaining uh, you know, variability site to site. And it turns out for the data set we have, uh, it requires that there's a change in that transit time distribution shape between sites to explain differences. And kind of uh, the curves here is red and blue. These are just examples. They're models that fit equally well to everything, to concentration, discharge, and deuterium isotopes, except they are distinct in their prediction for the silicon isotopes, right? One fits way better. And so in that way, adding this new tracer is actually giving us you know, helpful constraints on the problem. Okay, so with that, I've talked about a model for predicting solute concentrations and, and river flow, and we need that to get flux. And so with this, I can get the flux of calcium, the flux of sodium, or whatever. But if I want to understand carbon cycle processes, I need to somehow translate a sodium concentration or a sodium flux to a carbon cycle effect. And so I want to kind of sort of shift over to thinking about how we do that translation. And it turns out it's, it's not um, super complicated, but there, it's a little tricky. So ultimately, we might want to predict the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. And it turns out, though, that there's a ton more carbon in the ocean than there is in the atmosphere, and the two uh, communicate via gas exchange. And so kind of the longest time scale, we'd expect that the atmospheric CO2 level is going to about track the ocean CO2 level. So if I want to be able to predict atmospheric CO2, really what I should be able to predict, or I should try to predict, is the PCO2 of the ocean. And to do that, right, uh, it turns out the PCO2 of the ocean is defined by carbonate equilibria. So that is to say the set of chemical equilibria that describe how CO2, when it dissolves in water, partitions between very dissolve, various dissolved species of carbon. So carbonic acid, bicarbonate, carbonate ion. And uh, to sort of predict this sort of speciation, turns out I, I can just need two parameters. And the you know, ones I'm gonna pick are alkalinity and dissolved inorganic carbon. So alkalinity is this nebulous concept, right? It's something about acid buffering capacity, but for uh, all intents and purposes here, we can approximate it as the difference between the sum of strong base uh, cations and, and, and strong base, uh, or strong acid anions. So uh, the other parameter is sort of this dissolved inorganic carbon, which is the sum of all of the aqueous carbon species. And these two are perfect to pick because they behave conservatively. So they're easy to keep track of, whereas pH would be harder to keep track of. Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, um, we can uh, write weathering reactions, so this calcium silicate, as generating both alkalinity 
and or DIC. So here is this silicate mineral I showed before, um, releasing calcium ion, and it's releasing that in excess of strong acid anions, so it's generating alkalinity. And here we also have uh, this calcium carbonate mineral dissolving, producing uh, carbonic acid, so it's contributing to DIC. Now I've done a little bit of a trick here in that I wrote these as half reactions. So I just wrote protons and I didn't tell you where they came from. Uh, kind of at the top of the um, presentation, I, I fed you the canon, which is that protons come from CO2 dissolving water, right? If I dissolve CO2 in water, I can kick off two protons to sort of drive these reactions. But it turns out a lot of rocks um, will have this mineral pyrite in it, so iron sulfide. And when you expose iron sulfide to oxygen, which is in our atmosphere, it oxidizes to sulfuric acid. And as you can imagine, that sulfuric acid is very reactive in the environment. So in principle, I can drive all of these weathering reactions with uh, sulfuric acid. And as you might intuit, the carbon cycle impact of sulfuric acid weathering is going to be a little bit different than carbonic acid weathering. And so to kind of figure that out, one has to write all the possible weathering reactions out in a kind of coherent and consistent manner. I did that, I'll spare you the details and show you the result. So this is a plot of, of alkalinity of the ocean on the x-axis and the dissolved inorganic carbon of the ocean on the y. And the colored contours are the, the sort of PCO2 of, of water, uh, of that ocean water, um, but you know, log transformed. And you can see that those contours are close to one-to-one. -one. So this black dashed line is a one-to-one -one line. And so I can sort of think about whether or not a weathering reaction is gonna impact CO2 in the ocean by asking whether or not it moves where we start, which is the circle, um, you know, to the right or to the left of that one-to-one -one line. And we can write out all of our weathering actions as sort of the vector of how they move the ocean in alkalinity and DIC space. So it turns out if you just do silicate weathering by CO2, you add alkalinity, but not DIC. So we move to lower PCO2, so what we expected. Uh, if you do carbonate weathering with CO2, um, you add alkalinity and DIC, but in this two to one ratio that still plots you in the CO2 drawdown space. What's weird is if we do sulfuric acid weathering of carbonates, we add DIC, but not alkalinity. So actually PCO2 goes up. So in this case, weathering works backwards. And if we do uh, silicate weathering with sulfuric acid, we add neither alkalinity nor DIC, so we just stay put. Now this balance on the one-to-one -one line is kind of one way to think about the problem, but alternatively, we can recognize that the ocean um, buries or exports alkalinity and DIC um, by forming carbonates. And so we can sort of think that the ocean's constantly removing these uh, species in a two to one ratio um, because that's essentially what it's doing by making limestone in coral reefs, et cetera. And so instead of balancing on a one to one, we should balance on a two to one. And so I can sort of think about this, sort of these vectors, sort of add them up, get the sort of vector sum and ask whether it balances the two to one, right? If it's equal magnitude of the same slope, um, then uh, the inputs match the outputs, so we'll stay put at a constant PCO2. If there's an, in, you know, an imbalance, right, then we're gonna move, and we can predict the direction of that movement in, in terms of PCO2. So the difference between balancing on one to one or two to one ends up being a matter of time scale. Uh, sort of short time scales, the one to one balance is what matters. Long time scales, and so what I mean by long is kind of the calcium residence time in the ocean, so on the order of millions of years, the two to one is what matters. And so we can kind of generate separate predictions for how a river is gonna affect the carbon cycle on long and short terms. And, and we know exactly now what we need to do, right? We need to measure for all these four reactions, how much is happening, and then sort of add them up to get the sort of net slope, uh, you know, or this net sort of ALK DIC ratio. And um, the way we're going to figure out which reaction is happening where is by uh, looking at some data uh, from the proving AADs in Amazon. And this is just a case study. And I just, uh, I actually forgot that I put this slide in here, but I did want to show you a picture and just orient you before I show you all the data, like this is the spot I'm talking about. It's in Peru, it's in the mountains, and we can take samples all the way from the Andes mm -hmm. down to um, uh, the sort of Amazon floodplain. So the way we're going to back out what re weathering reactions are happening is to use elemental and isotopic ratios as tracers of solute sources. And so the theory here, um, I'll sort of walk you through that whole statement. So we can make measurements of rocks or water, uh, and we can take what are our measurements of ions, so in this case, mm -hmm. um, sodium ion and, and calcium ion, 
and we're just going to normalize them by the sum of uh, all of the major cations, so sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium. And these, for most rivers and, and for the ocean, are the lion's share of the alkalinity budget. So that's why we want to keep track of those specifically. And so uh, we can measure um, sort of rocks. And so I can dissolve bulk rocks and sediment, and I get these black squares. And these are dominantly made of silicate minerals. And so these represent the chemical composition or sort of the elemental ratios of uh, silicate weather. Now, all of these rocks contain maybe a weight percent or less of calcium carbonate. And so I can dissolve selectively that calcium carbonate using a weak acid leach, and I'll get these open white squares. And these represent the composition of carbonates in the watershed. And as you'd expect, they're depleted in sodium, enriched in calcium. Now, when I have my river samples, I can sort of think about where they are along a mixing line as telling me of all the cations, what proportion is coming from the weathering of silicate rocks versus carbonate rocks. I can extend this logic to isotopes. So here's a plot of the sulfur isotope composition of dissolved sulfate on the x-axis. And on the y-axis is the sulfate concentration of the water of that same sample. Uh, you can ignore the colors for a second, but what I want to point out is there's these set of samples that are very high sulfate concentrations and have a particular sulfur isotope composition that matches the isotope composition of pyrite in the shales in the watershed. So I can interpret based on that uh, connection that the sulfur in those waters is coming from the oxidation of that uh, pyrite. Now, uh, the color coding is the sort of strontium isotope composition, the 87-86 ratio of strontium in that exact same water sample. And you can see the samples that are enriched in sulfate that have this particular sulfur isotope composition also have very high 8786. And it turns out that Andean shales also have very high 8786 ratios. So we're getting redundant information, right? Multiple concentration uh, ratios and, and, and isotope ratios are pointing us to the same uh, conclusions. And, and that's actually really great because now we can use that redundant information in the form of an inversion. And so what we can think about is that sort of the, any elemental ratio or isotope ratio uh, we measure in the river is just the weighted average of the sort of isotope or, or elemental ratio of all of our sort of end members, right? Silicate rock, carbonate rock. And these weighting factors, these F, or the fraction of all the cations derived from that particular source. And so I'm gonna use this model to sort of invert or, or separate um, for all the cations, what comes from the weathering of dolomite, uh, limestones, uh, shales, uh, granites, dissolution of evaporites, and rainwater. And I'm going to do that using a sort of suite of major trace elements and, and their isotopes. And, um, you know, some of these end members, right, like if you look at this plot that I sort of shaded out, uh, there's uncertainty, right? Not every silicate rock in this watershed is an identical composition. So I'm going to incorporate that uncertainty by kind of doing a Monte Carlo simulation where I just do the inversion over and over and over again with different uh, end members and, and different uh, sort of analytical uncertainty incorporated, so I can get some sense of, of my uncertainty. And really the things I'm going to pull out of the inversion are to say of all the cations, so of what comes from carbonate weathering and silicate weathering, what fraction comes from the weathering of carbonates, and of all of that total weathering, carbonate plus silicate, what fraction is driven by sulfuric acid. And it turns out, right, the ALK-DIC ratio of weathering is a unique function of both of those parameters. So if I can constrain those two, I can get the ALK-DIC ratio, and then that tells me what the PCO2 effect is of weathering in that particular watershed. So we did that inversion, and let's look at the results. So um, uh, this x-axis, okay, of all the cations released from weathering, what fraction is from carbonates? Y-axis, again, of all of that total weathering, what fraction was driven by sulfuric acid? And then now I've color-coded three uh, regions. So in this dark gray up top, this is to say the combination of uh, the X and Y axis lead to uh, more DIC release than alkalinity so that the system in effect is pushing the ocean to release CO2 uh, instantaneously. This lighter gray is um, where the, the ALK DIC ratio is different from that two to one. So on this sort of long million year time scale, weathering is pushing the ocean to release CO2. On uh, this white region here is where we plot in CO2 consumption. That is to say, weathering is working the way we think it is, and it is pushing the ocean to draw CO2 out of the atmosphere. Right off the bat, you can see that these samples we have from our high elevation mountain watersheds plot firmly in the region of CO2 release. 
So the conclusion there is that mountains are a CO2 source. And not to belabor the point too much, but this is whether and working the exact opposite way that we're all taught. Uh, and that's kind of interesting. Um, if we look at our floodplain samples, which are at lower elevation, they plot where we think they should. They're drawing CO2 down. Now we might wonder, is this some curiosity of Peru or is this observed other places? And can I reconcile this with theory for how I think this should work? And the answer on both accounts is yes. So it turns out, uh, you know, if you go to Taiwan, the Himalayas, uh, mountains in, in, in Canada or New Zealand, you get the same result. Mountains are releasing CO2 as a consequence of weathering. And to kind of reconcile that with theory, we took this sort of 1D advection reaction model from um, Darcy Lee, and we sort of put both plagioclase and pyrite in it at different concentrations and simulated weathering. And we varied sort of uh, this, this sort of weathering duration, which in a, in a way is uplift, to say whether the sort of tectonic uplift rate is slow, like we might expect in a floodplain, or fast, like we might expect in a mountain. And it turns out when you get fast uplift, um, you get this uh, increase of the amount of pyrite weathering over silicate weathering. And the sort of amount of excess pyrite weathering is enough to drive CO2 release. And so the sort of normalization I did here is sort of taking into account uh, sort of the carbon cycle effect. So we can see with, you know, about a weight percent pyrite in our shale um, as compared to 10 weight percent uh, feldspar, we are being able to drive CO2 release at, at, at sort of high uplift rates consistent with mountains. Now, you know, one weight percent sulfur, it's a lot, but that's a rock you can hold in your hand, right? That's something like a real shale. And it turns out in all of the erogens I mentioned, right, in, in Andes, you're uplifting black shale, in the Himalaya, you're uplifting black shale, and so in Taiwan, certainly as well. And so it turns out, just as sort of, uh, you know, maybe there's a reason for it, but it just stands as the observation that most of the current sort of sites of mountain uplift are uplifting very sulfur rich rocks. And so we might wonder what that means kind of for the long term carbon cycle. So over the last 15 million years, right, all these are, you know, different mountain ranges have come online, they sort of uplift. And the original expectation was the uplift of the Himalaya or the Andes or New Zealand would be drawing CO2 down. And certainly we do CO2, see that CO2 gets drawn down. So these blue um, sort of symbols are our reconstruction of ancient CO2 levels. And you can see that sort of when we think uplift began, CO2 drops. But it reaches this flow, right? It kind of stabilizes at some point. And um, you know, that really had not been explained. And it turns out if you add in this effect of sulfur, you can explain that stabilization. So we sort of think that sulfur is an important component of tectonic forcing on uh, Earth's climate and carbon cycle. Now, another kind of thing that we've sort of noticed with the whole sulfur story is that it appears to be very prevalent in glaciated catchments. And so um, I'll sort of walk through this plot. So the X and Y axes are, are sort of, again, elemental ratios of, of dissolved river water. X is the sort of sulfate over sodium. Y is the calcium over sodium. And I've plotted three data sets. So this glow-rich data set, I introduced that before. It's about a million samples from 10,000 rivers. And so it's plotting all of them. Um, and that's the idea of like, I want to get an idea of what the average chemistry of a river is by taking the most rivers and adding them together. Another way to get an average is to take the world's 50 biggest rivers, which is what I plotted in red. And that's to say, I want to average over the most land surface, not the most number of rivers, to kind of figure out what is the, the typical chemical composition of a river. In blue is sort of this fit per purpose compilation uh, we put together of just rivers where there's a glacier in the catchment. And you can see that they plot, these glacial rivers plot in sort of distinct ratios, right? They're shifted away from either the most rivers on earth or the most land surface area of rivers, um, these red or these black. And, and, and those two ways of kind of coming up with an average agree with each other. So it appears as if there's something weird about glacial rivers. And as I said before, right, CO2 release from rivers is this coupling between the weathering of carbonates, which release calcium, and oxidation of pyrite, which releases sulfate. And so this enrichment in both calcium and sulfate could be linked to the oxidation of pyrite being uh, preferred in glaciated catchments. And if that's the case, um, this might actually be a kind of cool feedback in the climate system. If you start to cool the climate by drawing CO2 down, you get more glaciers. Now all of a sudden, all these watersheds, instead of drawing CO2 down as they once did, now start releasing it back up to sort of counteract whatever's drawing CO2 down in the first place. 
And so this might place limits on the global extent and duration of glaciation. And to me, it's curious that the sort of time period of Earth's history where we did have global glaciations, sort of the sort of snowball Earth events, was a time period when we had really low or absent atmospheric oxygen. And oxygen is the key ingredient we need to oxidize pyrite. Now, uh, this was sort of brought up by someone else, and I, and I think it's a fair idea, but we're sampling all of these glacial rivers during an interglacial period, right? Today, it's interglacial. And so we don't really know, right, is this sort of signature of sulfuric acid the highest during peak glaciation, or is it these interglacial intervals that's causing this pattern? And, you know, for million-year time scales, it might not matter, but we might want to resolve that detail out because it's important. And so to think about exploring that problem, uh, we decided to go to Iceland. And uh, Iceland doesn't have a lot of sulfur, right? Basalts are pretty poor in sulfur. There's not a lot of calcium carbonate in basalts either. Um, but what it serves as is essentially most of it is one rock type of basalt. And I kind of think that we know the chemistry of basalts. If I go to sort of uh, places that have shales, shales can have any chemical composition you, you want them to. And so at least we're going here, we're defining our bedrock and allows us some extra ability to interpret the chemistry. And uh, before we went there, uh, I told my uh, sort of master's student, uh, Trevor, to compile all the Iceland river chemistry data that had ever been collected. And here, just sort of plotting as calcium and sulfate concentrations, and again, separated by glacial and non-glacial rivers. Uh, we get the result we got before. The glacial rivers are all enriched in calcium and, and, and sulfate. Um, but maybe what you can see more than the slight enrichment is the substantial overlap, right? They are very, very similar to each other. Uh, and we might wonder, right, like, well, what's going on? Maybe glaciers are a bit different, but it seems like there's, there's a, another factor that we might be sort of uh, accidentally convolving in this definition of glacial versus non-glacial. And so we did that. We went to one specific study watershed. So this is uh, a name I can't pronounce, uh, sort of in this region of Iceland. And there are no glaciers in it today, but it was deglaciated 10,000 years ago. So um, we can see the effects of that glaciation and the sort of shape of the catchment. And we went and collected water samples at all these points up and down the river. Uh, and this was done by another grad student, uh, Preston Kemeny. Uh, and we just measured the sulfate concentration and the sulfur isotope composition of that sulfate. And you can see right off the bat, there are these coherent spatial patterns. And in case you forgot, right, this concentration range of sulfate is the range you see over the whole island of Iceland, both glacial and non-glacial. So we're able to get the full range in just this one small region. Um, and we highlight these really interesting spatial patterns. And so the sort of interpretation here is that um, these tributaries that have low concentrations and high sulfur isotope ratios, so that matches what you'd expect for rainwater. And the shape of all of the sort of valleys um, are these broad U-shaped valleys that are flat at the bottom because they're filling with sediment. So we think that this valley filling is protecting the bedrock from undergoing chemical weathering. In contrast, where we see high sulfate and a low delta 34S, where we get the signature of basalt weathering, um, all of the valley shapes are uh, indicative of fluvial incision. We get these V-shaped valleys uh, in the sort of most intense V at the bottom where the river is actively cutting into bedrock. And this sort of bedrock incision is, is driven essentially by isostatic rebound. And so this is sort of linking that uh, it's a deglacial process that is enhancing the uh, exposure of reactive phases or, um, or fresh rock um, in Iceland. And so that's maybe one of the reasons because essentially Iceland was so pervasively glaciated in the past that, that the glacial and non-glacial rivers tend to blend together. And um, I'm about out of time and, and I kind of wanted to say one thing um, very quickly and, and that's kind of to sort of touch upon this valley filling thing. So if these valleys that are filling with sediment, right, this is essentially protecting the rock from weather. Um, and does that mean, right, that since they're being protected, that the, the carbon cycle impact of those valleys is, is relatively minor because, um, you know, it, it's, there's not this active weathering that we see in uh, the sort of tributaries where there's this fluvial incision. And this might matter, right, because we sort of might want to, across the whole landscape, what is the number of valleys that are filling versus incising, and does that tell us something about the carbon cycle? Um, We've been thinking about this um, kind of from a different angle, and that is to say, well, what's the time scale and, and uh, effect of this valley filling? So here's just uh, 
uh, the sort of river long profile, so sort of distance along the river channel, the x elevation of that river on the y. Um, and we're just sort of plotting the elevation of the river in black here. And what I've been able to do is sort of pick out um, sort of the depth to bedrock in these salmon colors. And you can see there's this wedge of sediment. And you can kind of assume, right, that the, during, you know, last glacial maximum, the cache was scraped clean. We can kind of interpret that this wedge of sediment filled up over the last, say, 10,000 years. And if you take that rate and multiply it by the carbon concentration of the sediment, which we went out and measured, um, it doubles the amount of carbon sequestration in this catchment relative to what you predict by just measuring the river itself. Um, and this behavior of a grading as you prograde, which is sort of shown schematically here in a kind of geometric, right, as you fill, you, you both build up and build out. Um, this is typical of, of most lowland systems. So we're actually underestimating organic carbon fluxes because we're really only looking at the river and not paying attention to what's beneath the river. And if we sort of extrapolate wildly and say that if these rates we see in Iceland are typical of all recently glaciated landscape, then that associated organic carbon burial is essentially the same order of magnitude as global PSC export from rivers today. And this might be kind of an interesting glacial feedback, right? So that if we, um, uh, you know, raise CO2 so all the glaciers melt, we get this valley filling pulse that then draws CO2 back down by sequestering organic matter. And so this just got funded by the NSF so we're gonna do a bunch more work on this project uh, starting uh, this coming January. So with that, um, I'll sort of thank you guys for listening and, and answer any questions. And um, I kind of have some very general conclusions you can read, but I do wanna highlight that we have um, a, a postdoctoral research fellowship position opening up in our department at Rice. Ads out, not out yet, but it's gonna come out soon and the due date's likely in December. And so please reach out if that's something you're interested in. So uh, thanks.